This very long video is sponsored by Squarespace, but more on them later. Hi, I'm here once again at YUL Montreal. Why, you ask? Well, it's because Montreal is currently the only Canadian city that Qatar flies to, and that A350 of theirs is what we're flying on today. On this trip, I was traveling from Toronto all the way to Riyadh to visit my parents. This longest leg had me departing out of Montreal after a few hours layover. Heading east over the Atlantic, we'll cross over mainland Europe through Anatolia, Mesopotamia, and into Doha. Altogether, taking 11 and a half hours across some 6,460 miles. Montreal is perhaps not my favorite city in Canada, not because I think people there drink too much and are a bad influence, but rather because my ex lives there, who drank too much and was a bad influence. Regardless, if you find yourself having drank too much, the city's metro system serves all the major neighborhoods, even past midnight. However, if it's the airport you need to get to, that's a different story. You're much better off using Uber or Lyft. Yeah. Alright, just got off of my flight from Toronto. And while the Qatar flight is right over there, I do have to go get my luggage and check it back in. Oh lord. The third busiest airport in Canada, Pierre Elliott Trudeau International, like the other major air portals in the country, is split into three sections, domestic, international, and a US Customs and Immigration pre-clearance zone. Efficiently laid out all within one building, it's dead easy to transfer between the three. That is, unless you're me, who booked separate itineraries and hence had to check back in. So it does appear that I might have slightly miscalculated when it comes to picking a flight to come over here to Montreal. I thought, you know, they'd opened up their check-in counters within four hours of boarding, but apparently they haven't. Anyways, it can't be long now. Exactly 13 minutes and 48 seconds later, or something to that effect, the check-in opened to a trickle of passengers. There was a dedicated business class check-in, complete with these plush red carpets, which proved to be an absolute menace to any form of wheel-based human-powered luggage. Alright, just successfully checked in, and it's time to go through security, which doesn't look busy whatsoever. Back inside the security zone, Sadly, Camden Foods is apparently closed forever for the foreseeable future, but whatever this is, is open. We're in the domestic area and all you have to do to go into the international zone is to scan your boarding passes through those gates and you'll find yourself in there. You can, of course, come back out to use the ATM or eat at the restaurant or whatever it is that you do at airports. Just remember to bring your boarding pass with you, that's your ticket back inside. A few years ago, this barrier didn't exist, and little known secret, for some domestic Air Canada flights, you could actually go into the International Maple Leaf Lounge. Man, do I miss those days. Once inside, you're immediately greeted with a barrage of duty-free offerings, cosmetics, confectionery, contraband Cuban cigars, and countless other commodities which alliterate with the letter C, including alcohol. It works if you're dyslexic, don't think too hard about it. It's all well and good that Montreal is the only city that Qatar flies to in Canada, but it also just so happens to be the only major Canadian airport where every single lounge is currently closed. Qatar did compensate for this by providing each Q-suite passenger with a 30 Canadian dollar voucher that can be used at a selection of the food and beverage purveyors on the concourse. My personal recommendation is U-Bar, they have some pretty decent food and drinks, all at a reasonable price. But back to lounges for a minute, Qatar normally uses the National Bank Lounge here in Montreal, which reopened when I recently took this flight again in September. I didn't go in though, for I didn't have enough time, and like I said, during this flight that I filmed, they were still closed. Another lounge that recently reopened as of the posting of this video is the International Maple Leaf Lounge. If you're on a Star Alliance flight and can gain entry, this is a pretty nice place to kill some time. But once again, when I was there, it wasn't open. So 
So instead, I spent my short layover in Montreal on the concourse, which itself was very clean and quite comfortable. The Wi-Fi was fast, and whoever chooses the music that plays in the airport terminal really deserves some recognition. Oh, and I didn't end up using my voucher, opting instead to save some room for the food on the flight. Our flight today will be on this two-year-old A350-900. Qatar is one of only a dozen or so airlines that operates both the Dreamliner and the A350, but whereas this aircraft, along with the 777s, feature Q-suites in business class, the 787 doesn't, because it's not fat enough. Those have a different product in business, one which we'll check out some other time. Before boarding, let's get in a word from our sponsor for this video, Squarespace. Squarespace is your one-stop shop for everything websites. Whether you're a vain narcissist such as myself who thinks that someone would actually read an FAQ section comprised of questions no one asked, or just a bottom feeder YouTuber trying to make a buck by selling used tissues, Squarespace has you covered. Its feature-rich website builder and easy-to-integrate library of third-party services makes website building so easy and fast, I did both just for this video and just to prove my point. Better yet, it's completely free to try your hand at building your own website, you only pay when you want to go live. To do just that, follow my link in the description for an extended trial, and when you're ready to publish, use the coupon code on the screen for 10% off your first purchase for web hosting or domain. We boarded through just one gate, and with a mere 20% load factor, it made sense that everyone was invited on at the same time. On the 900 variant of the A350, Q Suites is split into two cabins. The forward one has 24 suites and an offset 1 to 1 layout, and there are 12 more behind the second set of doors. The odd numbered middle seats are positioned next to each other, backwards facing, and most impressively can be converted into a double bed, as we shall see later. The even numbered ones are closer to the aisle and offer a little less privacy, but as you can plainly see, they are still absolutely stunning. On the window sides of the plane, the odd suites are right next to the wall, offering the most privacy of any address on the plane. This is my seat for this flight, 5k. While the true window seats face backwards, the even number ones point the other direction, and are once again closer to the aisle. Be that it may, privacy was hardly an issue in any seat, as the doors, once closed, offered an unrivaled level of seclusion. Another impressive feature are the quad suites, which takes four middle seats and configures them into an open space that you can share with three other friends. Sadly, the airline does not provide said friends, meaning that you have to bring your own. Alright, now that we've had a look at the cabin, let's explore the suite. The first would be the display, which, although not 5K as the screen would lead you to believe, is still plenty sharp. Underneath that, you'll find the tray table, which slides out like this, and provides a truly huge amount of space once folded open. It's incredibly sturdy, and in my opinion, one of the best designed tray tables out there. Part of that reason is that it stows higher than other designs, giving you much more room in the footwell. There's plenty of space down here, either for storage or for sleeping. Moving on, let's have a look at the side console, which is very pretty. For those of you wondering, the top surface is not real marble, but rather some kind of plastic veneer. Below that, there's a smart little shelf to hide away all your modern day clutter. Its well thought out placement means it's right above the charging ports. On the corner, you'll find a row of very pretty gold buttons, mostly seat controls, lighting, and this dedicated Dungeons and Dragons button. Sadly, I didn't get to use it, but I'm sure it works really well with the quad suites. The remote control for once is not from Panasonic, but rather some kind of Android contraption. We'll have a look at that later. There is, of course, a universal power outlet and USB charge port, headphone I.O., and a contactless payment portal. There is a small literature pocket down here, and moving on to the side of the seat, you'll find this ottoman slash sight seat situation, which opens up to reveal even more well thought out storage. 
a top shelf to keep the smaller things within reach, water bottle holder, a slot for magazines in the back, and a dedicated space for the noise-canceling headphones, which we'll check out later. After takeoff, this whole thing can also be raised up to act as an armrest. Up here you'll find a coat hook, which makes a lot of sense as your clothes won't be in the way, and there's also an adjustable reading light slash sconce. The door slides out from here, but it was locked on the ground, so I'll show it to you later. The seat itself may look rather plain, however, it was surprisingly well padded and featured an adjustable headrest. Overall, this suite is a spectacular business product, verging on first class. The walls were high, and it not only felt roomy, but was genuinely very spacious. This was helped by the A350's larger windows, and the airline's decision to go with the Airbus optional extra cathedral ceilings which just means they don't install the middle bins, and yes, for some reason, that is an optional extra which costs more. What they didn't remove, alhamdulillah, are the individual air nozzles. These really should be a human right, especially in the Middle East. I am a millennial after all, so first things first, let's check out the Wi-Fi. Qatar offers one of the most reasonable packages out there, starting with 60 minutes of free connection, and then just $10 after that for the entire flight. The speeds were excellent, but the service did drop out a couple times throughout the flight, especially over bodies of water. It wasn't a big deal though, for the airline provided some scintillating reading material in the form of these beautifully printed menus. A hallmark of the airline's meal service is that there are no set dining times nor order. You can simply order whatever you want, whenever you want it. Something not very many airlines do in business. On top of the halal beverage selection, there is also a separate picture book detailing all the haram liquids in the galley. These came in the form of a pair of champagnes, white wines, red wines, more red wines, dessert wines, and if you're still somehow unimpressed, a whole slew of spirits and cocktails. Boy, do I have my work cut out for me. To start things off, I asked for another glass of the rosé, this time accompanied by toasted nuts. If you find yourself in this cabin, I'd also encourage you to try their tomato juice. I don't know what they put in it, probably crack, but it is by far the zestiest tomato juice I've ever had on an airplane. Alright, next up, food. Tonight's occasion started with the airline's renowned Meza selection, cold dips generously portioned to the point of my wondering as to how anyone would have room after this, and even more puzzling still why they only give you 4 slices of toasted baguette. Maybe it's so that you don't ignominiously stuff yourself on the first course, though I wouldn't blame you, it tasted as good as it looks. 
Next up was the soup of the day, which tonight was this spiced pumpkin concoction. I also learned that the phrase pumpkin concoction is very difficult to pronounce. But back to the soup, which was lighter and less viscous than your typical pumpkin soup, yet it nevertheless had all the familiar textures and aromas. It also served well to cleanse the palate for what was to come. In this case, the main course I went for was the chicken biryani. If you've watched my recent videos, you'll know that I'm still kind of obsessed with Indian food on airplanes. I especially love how they have this on their menu. Humble and unpretentious, the caterers chose to include a common staple on a menu which has far more sophisticated options beside it. It tells me that they get their passengers. While some are after a more special occasion, others, like me on this flight, just want a plate of well-made comfort food. This chicken and rice combination absolutely killed it. They didn't oversalt it to compensate for the altitude, yet still managed to bring out all the flavors. I actually took this flight again a few months later with my girlfriend, so we got to try the other dishes as well. This beef filet was a lot more ambitious than the biryani, and they absolutely butchered it, both the cow and the steak. It was undeniably overcooked, chewy, and on the bland side. It wasn't a complete disaster though. On this second flight, the girlfriend went with the ravioli, which was perfectly cooked al dente, and balanced in flavor by the savory sauce and the kick from the cheese. We both agreed that this was a far better option than the beef. Those of you who are keen-eyed might have noticed that the latter flight's meal service came with these candles. These were in fact reintroduced after my first flight. I know what you're thinking. No, they're not real candles, just electric lamps. And yes, they did copy Turkish Airlines, but really, who's complaining? Well, I mean, Turkish Airlines probably. What they didn't copy from TK are these equally cool salt and pepper mills. These, in fact, were instead stolen straight off of Lothansa's first class. Maybe that will make you feel better about taking these home yourselves. Thievery aside, the meal ended with dessert in the form of this little tart thing. It was actually really good, although I was sort of confused by what I was eating. A lot of flavors going on here, and admittedly at this point I've had a lot to drink. But I was not about to let that stop me from ordering a glass of Graham's port, especially when they served a 20 year old Tawny. Dinner done, I think it makes sense to visit the bathroom next, just from a purely practicality perspective. Qatar didn't do a whole lot with the default A350 bathroom, and not that they have to, because this lab is already very well designed. Spacious, ergonomic, and with a large countertop, it's pretty close to perfect. The airline also provides dental and shaving kits here a la carte, rather than in the personal amenity kit. Don't worry, we're gonna look at those later. But in terms of amenities in here, you'll find a face mist from Deep Teak, as well as a hand lotion. From a healthcare worker's perspective, I appreciate how they built the Sharps disposal bin into the cabinet. If your newborn baby is a lemon and has a factory defect, well they also have these extra large baby change stations. That's what they're for, right? While we're up here, let's also have a look at the provided pajamas. Like British Airways, they're from the White Company, a rather contentious name in this day and age, wouldn't you agree? Anyway, you get a pair of decently thick slippers, and they're grippy on the bottom too. Of course, it also comes with a pajama shirt, as well as pants. I'm not sure what sizes they go off of, probably American ones, because I fit really well into these mediums despite typically wearing large, and this is coming from someone who has become rather fat lately. As we were passing over the maritime provinces, we did go through quite a bit of turbulence, meaning the cabin crew weren't able to set up the beds just yet. Hence, I thought we'd use this time to check out the in-flight entertainment. Each Q-suite comes with a gigantic touchscreen, but if you're seated here, you're probably allergic to physical exertion, so this touchscreen remote makes a lot more sense. The main screen is sharp, bright, and seemingly supports HDR, having one of the most vivid color reproductions I've ever seen on an airplane. 
As an airline striving to be the very best, kind of like Ash Ketchum, Qatar surely did not disappoint in their in-flight entertainment department. Although, funnily enough, the original Pokemon series wasn't part of the library. Nevertheless, there is still a huge collection of films from all corners of the world. So much so, it has the same paradox of choice as Netflix. It's a paradox because it paradoxically leaves you with the anxiety of not being able to decide what to watch. And that's much the same with TV shows. You really just have to randomly choose something, otherwise you'll spend the entire flight deliberating between the options. Or if you haven't already, go ahead and watch Chernobyl, it's really good. The flight map uses Thales' 3D map software, which is objectively worse than the Panasonic equivalent. Of course, I'm being completely impartial, and it has nothing to do with me being turned down from a job from Thales in the past. At the very least, I still had a pointer to Mecca. It was rather exciting to find out that this A350 came with not two, but three outboard cameras. But unfortunately, due to the physics of nighttime, there wasn't a whole lot to see. A little while later, the turbulence finally subsided, which meant it was time for bed. Like I said earlier, thanks to the lack of passengers, those of us who wanted one got a double bed. And when I say double bed, I mean a sleepfoundation.org certified double bed. It also came with plush bedding, making this an overwhelmingly comfortable place to spend a night on an airplane. Once you get over the shock of just how much space you have on a freaking airplane, you also come to realize that it's also incredibly private, thanks again to those high walls. While there are still footwells, these had plenty of room and were not an issue at all. In fact, most of the first class products I've flown on don't come anywhere close to this level of palatial breath. Needless to say, I got some of the best sleep I've ever had in the air. After an unsurprisingly excellent night's rest, I woke up to what I think is the ultimate luxury of the modern age, a mug of hot coffee and a view out of an airplane window. And now that the sun has come up, I thought we'd have a look at the goodie bags. Beginning with this now all too familiar COVID era hygiene kit. This one's more basic, you get masks, gloves, and a bottle of branded hand sanitizer. Depending on your sex, you also get a male or female amenity kit. At this point, I think I might start telling them that I identify as a female, since the male ones are almost always uglier. Inside, you'll find a pair of black socks and eye shades, and a pair of these earplugs that comes in this super handy case, as well as a set of very pretty looking Monte Viviano cosmetics. These will come in especially handy if you plan on staying in the Middle East. I also forgot to show you the noise-canceling headphones. These were really ugly, perhaps as a measure to stop people from stealing them, but they did fit surprisingly well even on my abnormally large head. While we have the company of the sun, I also want to highlight just how pretty this suite is. Remember how 
I said you could have any meal at any time? Well... This was my breakfast, over the Alps. With a view like that, I honestly would have been happy with anything, but this omelette, oh my god, this frickin' omelette. I honestly couldn't believe that this was pre-cooked and reheated, it was so moist and it had the most perfect springy outer skin with all the gooey insides. Moreover, this entire meal was cooked to perfection. Warm buttery croissant, fresh fruit and yogurt, it was so impressive I ordered the same thing again the next time I flew this route. Screw the other choices, there's no way they're better than this. Well, good morning boys and girls. Um, now officially run out of things to do. Just had breakfast, just finished my coffee. This coffee was... A little weak sauce. I mean, usually the coffee makes me go to the bathroom immediately. But after two months of that, I've yet to feel the urge. Let's go check out economy. I've decided that we're gonna go with the clubby music to fit in with the clubby lights as we check out this clubby economy seat. Immediately, I'm impressed with the resolution on the screen and vivid color gamut. There's a handy shelf down here for your phone or other pocket sized items. It's again very well thought out with its proximity to the charging ports. The tray table is a compact design that folds out like this. It sacrifices absolutely nothing in terms of sturdiness, yet takes up only half the space. Space which can be left over for a leaner literature pocket, all contributing to a lot more leg and knee room, allowing you to really stretch out down here. Despite my lack of hand-eye coordination, each seat does come with a coat hook, as well as adjustable headrests. There's a generous amount of recline, and as an added bonus, if you find yourself a free row, the armrests do go all the way back so you can lie down. Overall, it's a superb long-haul economy product, one which we'll have a much more intimate look at sometime next year. So the coach seats were very impressive, but come on, this suite, it was unreal. These doors and walls were so high that at times I genuinely forgot that there were other people on the plane. As we headed over the Black Sea, the internet was still out of service, and despite having a lifetime's worth of movies and TV shows in my seat, I decided to go back to napping. I could have gone back to my double bed across the aisle, but honestly, that was just a little too much effort. Mishwar, they say in Arabic. Besides, the single beds were not too far off from what the double offers. There's plenty of room in the footwell no matter which way you sleep, plus there's ample length for your body. I'm 181 centimeters tall, or 5'11 for those of you in Burma, and that one other country that still uses Imperial for some reason, and I had tons of room, even at this halfway reclined position. When I woke up, the cabin crew welcomed me back to the world with a mug of ginger tea and a packet of biscuits. By the way, Qatar's flight attendants were phenomenal. Seemingly always on their feet, they were exceptionally proactive with everything you could possibly want. I felt like the lady looking after me thought of me as her small child, constantly asking if I was hungry, thirsty, or had the slightest ounce of discomfort. I think that if she could, she would have gone to the bathroom for me.
Okay, so there's about 90 minutes left in the flight, which means it's time for meal number three. The human body never ceases to amaze me, especially when you consider just how much food it's capable of consuming when said food is presented to you within arm's reach. For this third meal within 12 hours, I went with this quote-unquote light option of what is essentially microwave rigatoni bougied up with some parmesan and champagne. There were also other options like afternoon tea, or alternatively you can order another round of the four course meal I had for dinner. I didn't do that, I am not Mikey Chen, I am not capable of consuming my body weight in food with every soul cycle. This rigatoni was kind of just average actually, but that might have been because my taste buds were broken after how much work they've been through. Alright, so, Qatar. Let me start by telling you of my first time with the airline. It was 2010 and we were going on a sophomore year high school class trip to Beijing. I went to high school in Riyadh by the way, just in case that made no sense. In my books, any airline which can feed, water, and bed 35 hormonal teenagers for 10 hours without falling out of the sky deserves the highest of praise. As for Q Suites, well, Qatar Airways likes to call it first in business. It's a double entendre of one, how the airline offers the best business class product out there, and two, how its business class is essentially at a first class level. Now, I'm not going to dispute their assertions, it really is closer to first class than your traditional business. As for being the best, in my opinion, if it's not the number one business class out there, it's pretty damn close. I know I'm supposed to be impartial and find at least a few shortcomings, but it was genuinely difficult. The service was flawless, as was the seat. I guess the only real downside is that after flying Q Suites, you might be slightly underwhelmed with any other business class product out there. Alright, that's it for this video. I know a lot of you guys are looking forward to it, so I hope you enjoyed it. We'll continue the Qatar experience next time in the airport hotel, lounge, and on another short Q-Suites hop over to Riyadh. Until then, keep staying alive, and safe travels.